strengthening us. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would pour out your grace abundantly upon us today and that you would move in our midst and that you would touch our lives. Oh Lord, we all need you. There is something that each one of us needs from you. And so we come to you and we ask that you would meet those needs that we have, that you would take those burdens away. I pray at the same time, Lord, that whether or not you do anything, we will still love you. And we will love you always with all that we are. We thank you and we praise you and we magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, our message this morning is to remember our Savior. Last time, if you remember, last week we uh, talked about remembering our salvation. And uh, we talked about the great salvation that God has brought to us through Jesus Christ on the cross. And we want to take that the next uh, to the next step. And uh, this morning we're going to remember our Savior. Now, uh, Colossians chapter 2 is where we're going to start. And uh, here's the verse, and it, and it uh, talks about this relationship between our salvation and our Savior, obviously. Uh, it says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now that's our salvation right there. We have received Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that's uh, kind of the basis of everything uh, that we do. This is the basis of our life. We, we have this life, and, and hopefully we're here today because we have this new relationship with Jesus Christ. So, as therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, that's our salvation, so walk in Him. And that's where we remember, that's where we want to remember our Savior. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And so as we consider what it means to remember Jesus, and, and uh, th this is kind of linked to, this is a new year, and here we are, and, and we have these, we're going to be facing a whole lot of things this year. And uh, God is the one who knows what those things are. And so as we are going down this path of life this year, we want to remember that we are saved in the decisions that we made, and we want to remember our Savior. And so as we consider our Savior, we want to, first of all, uh, love him. And so love Jesus is the first step here, the first point in remembering our Savior. Now this is, uh, I'm, I'm taking this from Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4, and so that will be the verse, and here it is, it's a short verse. It says, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Now, what Paul is saying here is that everyone who loves Jesus Christ, it, it's sort of like a hope or a, or a promise here. Let grace be upon them. For everybody who loves our Lord Jesus Christ, let grace be with them. Now, grace is absolutely essential for the living of our life. Grace is the benefit that God gives us. Grace is the help and the blessing that he pours out upon us, whether we deserve it or not. I mean, as a matter of fact, when we're talking about grace, we're talking about the blessing of God that comes to us because we don't deserve it. It's just God's gracious act. It is his blessing. So let there be grace upon all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the love of our, Jesus, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ is qualified here. Let this grace be upon all who love Christ with sincerity. With sincerity. And so, uh, uh, it's not just uh, any kind of, yeah, I love him, or, you know, you know just kind of the, sometimes we can be a little uh, flippant in the way that we uh, throw that word love around, and, and uh, we use it in so many different contexts, like... Uh, I love pizza, or I love hot dogs, or I love that the New England Patriots lost yesterday. You know, say things like that. And, uh, if, uh, uh, if there are any New England Patriots fans here, well, do that. Uh, I can enjoy the rest of the football season now that the Patriots are out of it. And, uh, so I can, I can say I love that that happened, or I love you know all kinds of different uh, different things. But, but here we're talking about a love for Jesus Christ that should kind of permeate us in a deeper way. Grace be upon all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Now this word sincerity, there's no direct translation from the Greek into the English. 
And so uh, uh, here's, here's uh, what it means, this word. It says, uh, the, the meaning of the word is this, not able to decay or dissolve or be interrupted. That's what that word means, sincerity, in the original language. Not able to decay, dissolve, or be interrupted. It is uh, something that is incorruptible or something that is undying. So this is the kind of love that we are to have towards Jesus Christ. It is a love that is not able to decay, not able to dissolve, not able to be interrupted, not able to be corrupted, not able to die. And so in, my, in the New King James translation, it uses the word sincerity because when we have... When we use the word sincerity, we're talking about something that is something I truly believe. I, I truly believe this. This is not just a come and go type of thing. I truly believe it. And, and so in that sense, it's, it's kind of uninterrupted. I, I sincerely believe that this is a, a true uh, reflection of how I feel about Jesus. Uh, if you have another translation, it might have another word. But, but the word incorruptible. My love for Jesus is incorruptible. Again, it shows this, this, ongoing, this, this ongoing solid love for Christ. Or an undying love for Jesus. Any of these words can be used here to reflect the kind of love that we are to have for Jesus. It is a true, it is deep it is something that doesn't change with circumstances. It, does, it doesn't change with life. It will keep on going. It will never end. It will never die. That's how I love Jesus. Amen. And, and that's how each of us should love Jesus. That's what it says here. Those who love Jesus in this way. Let that be the kind of love that we have. And if we have those, that kind of love, let there be grace that comes upon us. So, so it's a powerful word here, a strong word. And uh, I've been talking about my chickens lately, and they don't love me like that. <laughs> right? You know, they, they just don't. They love me because I'm carrying their food or their water or because whatever. I don't know what they're thinking in their little brains there. But uh, they don't have this kind of love. And, and um, Christine was reading a book not too long ago, and, and um, so she mentioned this uh, to me. And it said this in the book. If, if Jesus never did another thing for you besides your salvation, if Jesus, I don't know what it is about my grandkids. <laughs> and neither of them can stay in the service because they're so loud. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you saw uh, Jade, our new grand our latest uh, grandchild. So Sophia has. Heard this morning. That was her scream. <laughs> These are all going to be preachers or singers at least, right? <laughs> so, you know, something, teachers and. and uh, all right, wonderful. Okay, now it interrupted my really powerful point that I was making here. <laughs> so let's come back to it. If Jesus never did another thing for you except your salvation, would you still love him? Now, that, that's really where our love for Jesus is revealed. Are we like the chickens who love Jesus because of the benefit that we receive from Him? Or do we truly love Jesus with an incorruptible, undying, deep love? That no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to still love Him. Is that the kind of love that we have? That's the kind of love we should have. We don't want to have the love of chickens. We want to have this true undying love for our Savior who saved us. And so may grace abound upon him. Upon him. And this is, this is where we need to really examine our hearts and examine our lives. I mean, why are we here this morning? Uh, is it you know, for the fellowship, which is a good thing? Is it because we have friends? Family, those are great things. Um, is it the, I don't know, whatever, why are we here? I hope it's because we love Jesus and we want to worship Him among all, you know, and still do all of those other things. So, if we love Jesus, let us, let us remember Jesus and let us love Him 
sincerely, truly, deeply, with an undying kind of love. Secondly here, if you love Jesus, then walk with him. Walk with Jesus. So going back to our passage, the first passage, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you have received Jesus Christ, the Lord, walk in him. So if you have received him, if you have been saved by him, then, this is kind of the natural consequence, the, the natural consequence of that, if you have received him, then walk with him. Walk with him. Now, what does it mean to walk with him? That's just the just a way the Bible talks about how we live our lives. So, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, then live for him. Let your life be the Christian kind of life. When people look at us and, and when they see our lives, they should recognize that our life is a little bit different than everybody else's. And that difference is because we are Christians and we believe in Jesus and we read the Bible and we go to church and we pray because we do these things. They should recognize that in us. If we have received Jesus as our Savior, well, then let us live for him. That's just kind of the natural next step. We ought to live and to walk with him. Now, this, this verse here has some interesting, um, this whole passage has some interesting uh, 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 connections that it makes here. So it says, as you have received Jesus Christ, the Lord, so walk in him. So what does that mean, to walk in him? Well, it means two things primarily. First of all, to be rooted in him, to be rooted in Jesus. So to walk in Jesus is to be rooted in him. So if you can picture a plant, and uh, here's your little plant, and it sends down its roots deep into the ground. And uh, as it sends those roots deep into the ground, then uh, uh, it, it, they spread out into the soil, and they get the nutrients and, and the water that needs to, to thrive. And so this is how we want our life for Jesus to look like. So here I am, I've been saved, and I'm going to walk with him, which means I'm going to cast down into the ground, if you will, the roots of my heart deep into Jesus. So I gain my nourishment from Christ. I gain my, my life from him. I gain my strength from him. I am pushing my roots deep down into <coughs> the ground. You know, uh, I like to get out in the yard, especially in the springtime, and Try to fix it up a little bit, and they have all these weeds all over the place. I don't know, every year there's like a new variety of weed that pops up <laughs> in my yard. And uh, um, so I try to pull some of them out, and some of them, uh, so th some of them spread their roots. They're kind of shallow, and they kind of spread their roots along the top of the ground, and they're, you know, you can just grab them and pull them up, and kind of satisfying to pull it up, and you get the whole root system with it. But then there are some of these other weeds, and they just send their stalk straight, their, their root, their main root just goes straight down, and uh, every time you try to pull them up, it's, they just snap, because, you know, it's just, it's so firmly into the ground that you can't just pull it up, it's, you know, you really have to kind of dig a little bit in order to pull the root up, otherwise it just breaks, but that's the kind of Christians we want to be, we don't want to have this shallow root system that just kind of goes on the surface, that, that, we don't want to be like that as Christians. We want to be like that other one that just sends us straight down into, into our relationship with him. And, uh, and Jesus means just so much to us. And, and we are nourished in our lives by him. And so, if you have received Jesus Christ as the Lord, walk in him, being rooted in him. Being rooted in him. And then it says, being built up in him. So this is another image that's used here. Not only is our walk with Jesus to be like the root that goes deep into him, but it is to be built upon him. And there are a couple places where the New Testament just uses this imagery of uh, this, this uh, firm foundation, this solid rock upon which we build our house. And so we want to live our lives. Uh, Jesus, I think, told the most memorable parable about the, the, the house that's built on the sand and the house that's built on the rock, right? Do you remember that parable that, that he taught there? And we want to make sure that we build up our house or build our lives upon the foundation of Jesus. 
We want to build upon Jesus the rock. And if we build upon Jesus the rock, when the storms come and the rains fall and the hard times come upon our lives, uh, yes, it's still raining and it's still thundering and the waters are still beating upon us, but we are still standing. In other words, the trouble is all around us and beating upon our house, but because we're firmly founded on Christ the rock, we won't, we won't be moved. That's how we want to live our lives. Built upon <coughs> Jesus. If we build our house or we build our lives on anything else except Jesus, when the hard times come, we will get washed away. Uh, we will be hurt by the storm that beats against our house. And we don't want that. We don't want to have a house that is on the sand that gets washed away when the floods come. We want to build our house upon Christ. Now, as we look at this verse, it says, As you therefore have received Christ the Lord, so walk in him, being rooted and built up in him. And the, the result of this is that you will be established in the faith. And, and this is kind of the call from, from me as a pastor to our church here, uh, in this new year especially, that as we move along in life this year, that we will be established in the faith. That, that's my heart. I want to see us grow strong in the Lord. Amen? I hope that that is yeah. your desire as well. Amen. That, uh, that we go along and, and we become stronger and stronger than, than we were. You know, sometimes the, the temptation is that strong Christians kind of look down on the, on the, the not-so-strong Christians and there's criticism and there's judgment and and, uh, and all this. I, I don't put up with that very much at all. Well, I shouldn't put up with it at all, at all, right? There should be none of that going on. We are all at different stages. And our heart and our desire ought to be that we all increase and, and grow in our walk with the Lord from wherever we might be. So, if you're a brand new Christian, or if you're considering to be a Christian, that is wonderful. And let's go from there to learn some more things about the life of Christ. And if you've been a Christian for a long time, and you're strong, and you're mature, and you're walk, that's wonderful. And let's go on from there, and grow stronger, and grow deeper in our walk with the Lord. I want us to be established in the faith, nourished, rooted in Him built on him, established in the faith. And so this year, I hope that we will make the kinds of choices that will help us grow as believers. That we will grow in such a way where we'll begin to see Christ at work in our lives. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Where we will begin to think of him more throughout the day while we're at work or while we're at school. Maybe in the past when we were at work, we just didn't think about Jesus until we got off of work and got home. Or maybe if we were at school, we were just having so much fun with our friends and, uh, and uh, doing homework and all of that, that we didn't think about Jesus. Right? So much fun doing homework. Anybody there? <laughs> that we didn't think about Jesus until we were done with it. But I want us to instead, when we are at work, to think about Jesus and to be ready to help our co-workers because everybody needs Christ in their lives, right? Amen. And while we are at school, even if we're Kids, you're, you're never too young to serve Jesus. To point your friends towards Christ. I want that to be the case. Where we're thinking about Him, where we're crying out to Him, where we're praying to Him, where we're living, where, we're, where we are making choices that honor Him. Where we make the kind of choices that send our roots down deeper. Where we make the kind of choices where we continue to build upon the rock. And we are strengthened. This last phrase here is interesting, and it's kind of the, the result of, of all of this. If you have received Jesus, and if you're walking in Him, and if you are rooted and, and built up in Him, and if you begin to be established in the faith, there is going to be this abounding with thanksgiving. This abounding with thanksgiving. So I was reading a book by Matt Chandler, and, and uh, towards the end of it, he was talking about this, and and uh, he was sharing a story about how they had to rush his uh, child to the hospital. Uh, the child had a seizure. I think it was his daughter. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember. 
But um, he is thinking about rejoicing in the Lord always. Rejoicing in the Lord always. And he was talking about how can he rejoice when he is unsure about what, the, what is going to happen to his, his uh, daughter. And, um, and so he's going through this and he had a real mature response. And, and when something bad is happening, I might not be, yippee. As a matter of fact, if something really bad is happening in my life and I go, yippee, that you might look at me like, what is wrong with him? But, but uh, while I, I might sorrow and I might hurt because of what is happening, it's like when we lose a loved one. I might sorrow and, I, and I'm hurting because of, of that that is happening. Yet, there is a deeper presence in my heart and in my life that goes beyond the things that are around me, the circumstances of my life, that should bring me everlasting joy and enable me to rejoice no matter what. And that deeper thing is the fact that Jesus has saved me. And yes, I might have pain in this life and have to go through hard things, and I might be facing death at some point, but in Christ, there is more that, that is bigger than that death. Because there is new life to come beyond that. Where there is no more tears, and there's no more sorrow, and there's no more heartache, and there's no more pain. And that will go on forever. Now imagine, let, let's say, I don't know how old you are, but just fill in the blank, okay? Let's just say for the last 30 years I've had a horrible life. Right? Just, just fill in the blank. And just pretend your whole life has been horrible for, I don't know, however old you are. For me that's 23. No. <laughs> <laughs> however long, however old you are, let's say your life has just been horrible. And then you enter into the presence of the Lord for a hundred years. What, what is your 30 or 40 years going to look like after a hundred years in the presence of God with no sorrow, no trouble, no... Can, can you begin to see how... I, I mean, even if we have a good year, that kind of makes us forget what happened last year a lot of times. You know what I mean? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know how some good, some good days of blessing can quickly cause what's gone behind you to fade away. <laughs> and so if you just picture, if we can just picture ourselves in the presence of the Lord for eternity, this life amounts to not very much. It'll quickly get swallowed up in the glory of God. And that is something to be thankful for, always, regardless of the hurt and the pain and the struggle I'm going through now. And, and I speak for myself, too. It's just, so, it's just so hard sometimes to wrap our heads around that truth. It is the difference between having an eternal perspective as opposed to having a temporal right here kind of perspective. We want to have an eternal picture of life, not just a picture of what's going on right now. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight and strive and try to make it better. We should do those things. We should do the best that we can, we should work at the hardest that we can in order to, um, you know, have the best possible life that we can have for Christ. We should, but not everything is under our control. We have to remember that God is the one who is ultimately in control of everything. Praise be to His name. Thank you, O Lord, for all that you have done. Thank you for coming into my life and saving me. Praise the Lord, that will have eternal consequences and benefits and blessings for me. So, walk in Jesus, being rooted in Him. And let's, let me move on to the third point here. Be strong in Jesus' grace. Be strong in the grace of Christ. And I want us to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 for this one. And um, I think Colin read it at the beginning of the service. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And again, this, this passage here is talking about our life with Christ. We want to remember Jesus in everything. And uh, one of these, it was a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, I, I uh, shared from Philippians chapter, um, Philippians chapter 3, I can't remember, Philippians chapter 3 was talking about uh, forgetting things that are behind and pursue Christ, our, our pursuit ought to be 
of Christ. So this is kind of going on in the, the same vein there. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we just saw from the other verse in Ephesians how the grace of God, may the grace of God come upon those of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with sincerity, with an undying kind of love. So here it says, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So there's this encouragement that comes to us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to be strong in the grace that comes from Jesus. Which means that I might, there's the possibility that I might not be strong in his grace. Now, here's the picture. We, we automatically think that if God pours out a blessing upon us, that we will automatically be blessed. But there is actually, it actually tells us in the New Testament that we can resist the grace of God. And here the encouragement comes in a positive way to be strong in the grace of God. And so it's like this. If you can picture the grace of God like this big flood that just comes pouring down upon you like rain or like a waterfall. Here's the grace of God just pouring down like a waterfall. Well, I have a choice now. I can step away and say, I don't want to get wet. Or I can step under it and receive the grace of God and walk in the grace of God. And then I have a choice. And so the choice that stands before us is to be strong in God's grace. He is pouring out, pouring it out upon us because we love Him. And so let us walk in His grace. Let us be strong in the grace of God. Now this, uh, this past Wednesday night, uh, we were just kind of challenging one another in, uh, in our decisions and our choices for the coming year. And one of the things that, that I said was that um, uh, God, God pours out grace and there's grace present in this life. And we have the choice to, uh, to walk in it. So I gave the illustration of a, a former colleague of mine who was a classics professor. And he was... Because he was a classics professor, he taught you know, Plato and you know, some of the Greek philosophers and, and that kind of thing. And his big, his big thing was, I can, I can learn about God from reading Plato. That, that was kind of his big thing. And uh, so the question is, can I learn about God from reading Plato? Well, yes, I can. But if I read the Bible, there is so much more grace to be found. So much more truth to be found in concentrated form. So I can read Plato and uh, wade through all of these th things and try to apply principles of scripture to the things that are said in Plato. And, and that, I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying if you spend all of that time there, you will gain some nuggets of truth. Whereas when we go to the word of God, the nuggets of truth abound. And they are there for us today. It's like if you're looking for treasure and you go down to the landfill to look for treasure, right? Will you find some treasure at the landfill? <laughs> you might, after digging for a very long time and wading through the garbage, and uh, uh, you might find something valuable, right? And you'll be smelly for it. <laughs> there might be something there that you find valuable. But if you go to church or if you go somewhere else where the grace of God is pouring down like a flood, you will be more likely to find the treasure quickly and without all of the toil, without all of the smell. Now, I'm trying to make an illustration here. I mean, still, you have to go to the Word of God with the right heart and you have to dig for it. You know, you have to dig in it and you have to study it and... You have to spend time in prayer, and all that takes effort, and, and there's, there's a spiritual energy and effort that must be applied in order to gain the truth of Scripture. It's not an automatic thing. Faith is necessary. Just because you're here in church, you put yourself in a great position to be blessed by God, but it is not necessarily automatic that you will be blessed by God. You know what I mean? 
So there's, there's still all of that consideration. But praise the Lord that you're here. Because you have the greatest opportunity to be touched by God. Because you have made this choice to be here instead of somewhere else. And so that's the kind of choices that we want to make. Christ is working. Jesus is working in our lives in certain ways and in certain places. And we want to make sure that we make the choices that put us right there in the middle of where God is. That way we have the greatest opportunity to be blessed and to experience the grace of God. So let us make those choices. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And by making those choices, it shows that we are being mindful of Jesus, that we are remembering our Savior. And then the next one, endure hard, hardship for Jesus. Now this, this is a little uh, unpleasant, I guess, but let's read it in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus... Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of change. But the word of God is not changed. Therefore I, and here's the word again, endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So this passage is just a great passage. It kind of starts off with these ideas and it ends with these ideas in, uh, in verse 10. But enduring hardship for Jesus, and he, is, he uses several illustrations here. The first one is, to, is the soldier illustration. And so a Roman soldier, a soldier back in Jesus' day, uh, this, this was the life of a soldier. Uh, he had to follow orders. That means always told what to do. And right there, that's like a deal breaker for so many of us. We don't like to be told what to do. But anyway, a soldier has to follow orders, has to carry out those orders, Often without enough resources, he had to do what he was told to do as part of uh, being part of the army there. He had to carry equipment, which could be up to 44 pounds, and that would, be, that would include his weapons and include his provisions. And so 44 pounds, he would have to carry that equipment. And then uh, they often had to march long distances, depending on you know, where they needed to go. They couldn't just get on the, the flight to uh, so-and-so and uh, get there. They had to march. Sometimes they would do 22 miles in a day. So 44 pounds of 22 miles, um, this was kind of the, the, the way that the soldier lived. They were exposed to the elements, so they were out in the open. Um, the rain, they had, to, they, had to, they would get wet. If it was uh, hot, they would get hot, and so on. Fatigue, battling, they had to battle sickness. Often, you know, they didn't have, the, the things weren't as sanitary as they could be here, especially for us. And so uh, there's always sickness, and then you know your fellow soldier got sick, then you know there was a constant battle, battling of that. In an actual fight, there was the adrenal, adrenal, adrenaline rush of having to fight for life or death. There was fear that had to be dealt with. There was dealing with injury, the injury of your own, your own injuries or the injuries of those that are around you. There was exposure to pain and to the blood and the cries of others to trauma and to death. So this was the life of the soldier, exposed to all of these things. So Jesus uses this, uh, this illustration, which they would have been familiar with, and he says, you therefore must endure hardship as a soldier, right? A soldier endures hardship. So here the soldier, we are soldiers of Christ. And following Christ in this world is often accompanied by hardships. By hardships. Because we believe in Jesus. We have to sacrifice things and we have to put up with the ridicule and 
and uh, the comments of others, and thankfully we're not at a point where we have to be persecuted for our faith in, in Christ, although I think the days are coming pretty quickly where that might start to become a possibility here, even in the United States. But anyways, we are soldiers of Christ, and as soldiers of Christ, we have to endure hardship. And he says here, if you are engaged in warfare, no one who is engaged in warfare, in verse 4, entangles himself with the affairs of this life. No one who is engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. So, if we are going to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ, then we must not get entangled with worldly things. There is a distinction between what and who we are as Christians and as soldiers for Jesus and what the rest of the world is doing. And so if we're going to live effective lives for Jesus, we don't want to be encumbered by all of the other things. And so there, there's a certain sense in which just kind of putting aside things, and it's not that they're necessarily sinful things, but putting aside whatever we have to put aside in order to serve Jesus the most effective way. That's sacrifice. That's a, that's a giving up our life to follow Jesus. And so we should do that. We should not be entangled with the things that are going on. The second thing is, it says here, it says no one entangled, no one engaged in warfare, this is 2 Timothy 2, 4, entangles himself in the affairs of this life, and, and notice the next one here, that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So here is the idea of pleasing, seeking to please Jesus. We are his soldiers, and so we don't want to get entangled, but in our mind and in our heart is, I want to make these choices in order to please him. In order to please him, to make him happy. I want my boss to be happy with me. Imagine how your work ethic would change. If you had that attitude at your job, so I want my boss to be happy or pleased with my job. That, that's a good, kind of a good attitude to have. And so, living this life for Jesus, we want to have that attitude. I want him to be pleased with me. I, I'm going to, I'm not going to be entangled in order to please him who has enlisted me as his soldier. I want to please him. So, th this is this is a reflection of our desire, to, out of our love for him, that because we love him, and because he is our captain, our king, that we will do what we can to make him happy. Uh, he switches the illustration here from being a soldier to competing in athletics. In verse 5 he says, And if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Unless he does it according to the rules. Now, I know this is a little unusual given our, our uh, kind of um, setup that we have. How many of you have had kids in sports around here? Soccer, we, we did a lot of soccer in our family. And uh, uh, in, the, in the community athletics program, everyone's a winner, right? <laughs> Everyone gets a trophy at the end of the, at the, end of the year. And, uh, so anyway, that's, that's kind of uh, one angle to look at it from. But, but here we're talking about like a, we're talking about the Olympic style competition, where one person wins the gold, one person wins the silver, and one person wins the bronze medal. They're, they are not going to win if they don't follow the rules for their sport. They have to do it right. And then somehow, for some reason, when it comes to Christianity and seeking to, to uh, live for Christ, we, so many people have the idea that, well, I can do it any way that I want. I think God's okay with it, or with this or with that. I think I can do this. God loves everybody. I can do whatever I want. And, and we don't realize that there are a lot of exhortations in the scripture here, just read. I mean, this whole thing is an exhortation to us to follow Christ and to love Him. We cannot do it any way that we want. We have to do it the way He wants. 
He's our boss. He's our king. He's our leader. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what he thinks. I just have to line up with that. So we have to do it the right way. Not just do it anyway. We have to do it the right way. All right, I could say a lot more about that, but let's move on to the next one. All right, I gotta go faster here. All right, the last one here. And then he's talking about the farmer, the hardworking farmer in verse six must be first to partake of the crops. And uh, the operating word there is hardworking, to, to work hard. So we're gonna live for Jesus. I kind of alluded to this earlier. It is going to require our sacrifice and our, our hard work, our attention. Uh, and so, we love him, right? And he is worthy of it. And so it should not be a burden to us. And this might be kind of a tell as to how much we love Jesus. Is living for Jesus for you a burden? Or is it a joy? Do you think, oh my goodness, it's Sunday, I have to go to church again. Or, yay, it's Sunday, I can't wait to get to church. So there's two clock. Two clock. All right, there we go. So that that's just kind of just kind of apply that to your life and how Jesus wants you to live for him, and that's gonna be different for each one of us. Is it, oh no, I have to do it again, or it's coming up, or I don't feel like it, or I'm too tired, or there's a good game on TV. Or is it, well, Lord, I want every opportunity you put in front of me. I want to do as much as I can. It doesn't matter if it's a little thing or if it's a big thing. Just put the opportunity in front of me and I will do it. Whatever you want, I will do it. So let us have that attitude out of our love for Jesus to work for him and to serve him and to glorify him in everything that we say and everything that we do. Let us remember our Savior. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, today's the day to give your life over to Him. And if you are here, I pray that our prayer will be that the Lord would reveal the things in our lives, the, the changes and the adjustments in our lives that need to be made so that we grow stronger in our walk with Him. Let us remember Jesus who saved our souls. Let's stand as we sing our final song.